So what kind of communication strategies are there for us to try and address the, con the vaccine, vaccine conversation in a better way? Um, this is this is kind of data before COVID, but probably not. Too, well, it, 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 it's it's maybe shifted some here, but um, it's we have to kind of focus on where we spend our time on this. You know, we all know how busy doctors are. You're often got a 15 or 20 minute RV. You're trying to cover all kinds of things, and now you got to engage in somebody who's vaccine hesitant about COVID, which could blow up your whole schedule, right? <clears throat> so we've got the strongly. You got the people who you know are they'll do whatever you say. Um, that's supposedly 33% of this is parents, uh, this, and this is pre-COVID. Um, but, you know, with these folks, you want to just kind of like, hey, this is what's needed today. Uh, and, and I'll talk more about this, the, the, sort of a presumptive approach in a second. <clears throat> that's not our problem. We've got a lot of these people in the middle that are somewhere on a spectrum. Um, and then you've got a lot of these worries that don't agree that vaccines are necessary, don't agree that vaccines are safe. Says three percent here. We know it's more than that in North Dakota with the COVID vaccine, right? It's 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 worse than that. So one of the one of the first things that we really have to try and um, I, I want you really to convey strongly to our docs. I've heard this now uh, from a graduate student in our communications department who did did a bunch of focus groups with moms um, who were kind of vaccine hesitant and. She got story after story of them feeling um, dismissed, denigrated, made to feel stupid by their provider, like, like their thoughts or opinions didn't matter and that they were, they were an annoyance uh, to the doctor and their schedule. We have to convey to, the, to our providers that is like, that is a surefire way to push somebody further in the trench. <clears throat> and um, and, and we have to kind of recognize it, that there's something in human nature that resists this being coerced or being told what to do. <clears throat> um, and it may be by the very fact of acknowledging that these that our patients have a right and freedom not to change that makes actually change possible. Mary Larson, my colleague, will be getting a lot more into this in a second. Some of the psychology on this uh, that's been done, this Lewandowski is a, a behavioral psychologist talks about being careful on how we correct misinformation because there are some traps for us with this. Something called the continued influence effect, the familiarity backfire effect, the overkill backfire effect, the worldview backfire effect. What are these? <clears throat> continued influence effect is despite a re retraction, people continue to rely on misinformation. The measles vaccine causes autism. Study after study after study after study after study proving it doesn't, there's no association. Still got that association in my mind. Really hard to knock that myth out. So giving more data on like, no, it's not there, doesn't really work very well. A better approach is an alternative explanation. You know, that was kind of interesting back then. We actually don't, we, we found that isn't the case, but here's what we do now know about autism. Here's, here's what we found that really is a much more likely explanation of what causes it, right? Um, uh, so uh, repeated retraction, uh, strengthen the retraction through re repetition without reinforcing the myth. You wanna reinforce the alternative narrative or, <clears throat> or other facts. Familiarity backfire effect, repeating the myth increases familiarity, reinforcing it. We really don't wanna go, you know, we don't want to go down the path of infertility if we don't have to. We don't want to raise questions. We don't want to get into the these these things that kind of reinforce, like, oh, that is out there. That that concern is out there. Um, here we kind of talk. He talks about emphasis on facts, avoid repetition of the myth, try not to give that voice very much, um, reinforce the correct facts, and, and if you are going to have to bring up the myth, kind of trigger warning it. You know. Hey, we're going to talk about this thing out here. This is that infertility question, which, frankly, you know, it's it's really been a problem here and 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 really one of our biggest misinformation battles. But I think we should talk about it. You kind of give that warning ahead of time. <clears throat> Overkill backfire effect. Simple myths are just more cognitively attractive than complicated refutations. Did you know that we have 
20 prospective cohort studies. These are our best studies, actually, that really show causality. That, that there's no association there with me. Just, just doesn't sound as good as like, I think that vaccine could be coming for all this autism I'm seeing, you know, or infertility or whatever. Simple brief rebuttal is better. Fewer arguments in refuting the myth. Less is more. This last one, I think, is the biggest one here. Uh, I, I think this is the biggest problem we have now. And um, that that the position somebody has on their vaccine hesitancy is tied to their worldview. It's tied to my tribe, my people, the people that I associate with, the people that I group with. Leaving that worldview, leaving that group, changing over is, is, is kind of, it's, it's disloyal. It's leaving my tribe. It's changing, you know, kind of, it's, it's my worldview. Um, this is a bigger thing than just the vaccine. And this, I think, is a real important thing here. We have to af- find a way to affirm that worldview. We have to find a way to be empathetic and affirm that ro- worldview. Um, affirming manner by endorsing the values that they express. We can affirm the values underlying it. Really glad you take your, your health so seriously. You know, you are an engaged person in actively looking for information about health. We're, we're on the same page there. We're on the same team. Glad you really do that. Um, or whatever, whatever little bone you can find of affirming their approach to things um, will we'll get you, in, you know, into that. You're not going to be threatening that worldview. <clears throat> so, um, and you, you affirm their identity, self-affirmation of personal values increases rep- receptivity to evidence. That's one of the biggest things you need to accomplish in the training sessions to get, because we don't do this. We get pissed off when they're going to make my day go longer. We get pissed off that there's one more vaccine has it in person in my clinic. Like, God dang it. You know, I, I got to deal with this again. You know, this, the same misinformation trope. We, Mary will talk more about this. Resist that writing reflex. Find the fastest path to reaffirming their worldview. Um, this was an interesting study that looked at <clears throat> something that I find a lot of my medical and public health colleagues guilty of. <clears throat> How strong you make the argument. So this was a web-based survey of a volunteer cohort, fictional disease and a preventive vaccine, and they randomized people to getting different kinds of information on back vaccine risks, disease risks, And then a very strong versus weak messages negating the vaccine risks. I know these vaccines are perfectly safe. We've we've got mountains of data on this. Like I'm 100% sure these vaccines are fine, right? When you do that with a stronger message, it was more likely to make the person uh, move away from the vaccine. You are too overconfident and you're, you're, you're not believable. You're not credible um, when you are coming on that strong. <clears throat> um, it made people less likely to vaccinate when they were confronted with very strong vaccine risk negating messages. Better if we, you start with an acknowledgement. Yep, they do have some serious side effects. We, we've looked at these and we need to be aware of them. They can cause anaphylaxis in about five out of a million people. There is that weird clotting system, syndrome, about eight out of a million in you know uh, the Johnson & Johnson. We don't want the Johnson & Johnson for you today. There is this myocarditis. It's in young males. You're an elderly female. That's really not a risk, but, but yep, we, we do take that. Not that like, we know these are safe. You're fine. This is going to be perfectly okay. Um, I am, um, oops. Uh, there is old research that I'm going to show you. And then I'm going to think, I think I'm going to tell you to forget. And this is hard for me because this is what we did our whole HPV vaccine campaign around. Um, and that is, there, there was research that showed that kind of a, a return to some paternalism, which is sort of a bad word in medicine now. Everything is shared decision-making, cooperative, patient-centered, patient-oriented uh, care. Um, but when it comes to vaccines, there's, there's evidence, at least prior to COVID, that that sort of permiss- that permissive language. How do you feel about this? What do you think? As opposed to coming in with, this is what's needed for Susie today. She should get her, you know, Tdap, meningococcus, and HPV vaccine. Um, Sherry will get that ready here in just a minute. Um, Now let's talk about, you know, school performance, blah, blah, blah. It's an announcement as opposed to how do you think? What do you think? What are your questions? What do you feel? There's 
there's a significant body of research that shows that worked to improve HPV vaccination rates in several studies. <clears throat> this presumption of vaccination correlated with increased vaccine acceptance versus participatory communication. Um, now I'll say that and I'll say, I don't think this is gonna work with COVID. <laughs> I think people are way, you can kind of fly that under the radar with some vaccines, um, maybe even the HP vaccine. Everybody knows about the COVID vaccine. Everybody has an opinion about the COVID vaccine. Every, you tell me, but I kind of think if you came in and you saw that somebody's unvaccinated in your clinic and you're saying, Joe, uh, I see you haven't had the vaccine yet. Sherry's gonna get this ready for you. I'm, I'm really recommending for all my patients. Um, and now let's kind of talk about, you know, those hemorrhoids you've been having or what, uh, I think that ain't going to work. <laughs> um, so, um, th this is the, this is one of the studies that looked at the, you know, um, participatory versus a not more of an announcement approach. You guys see that blue line on my, your slides. Did one of you guys do that? Cause I don't know. Uh, did somebody do that by any chance? Cause I didn't, I don't, I don't think I did that, but I can't get it off. Anyway, um, uh, anyway, um, and this is another study that kind of showed way more acceptance in, they, they videotaped pediatricians uh, talking to the parents about the vaccine and that they came in with a presumptive approach. They got 74% acceptance out of the shoot as opposed to, hey, how do you feel about this? What do you think? They only had 4% and you know picked it up a little bit if they pursued. <clears throat> um, so we were really promoting this kind of presumptive approach. And then if you meet resistance, you change to other things. I'll leave it to you whether you personally think that's a good idea or if we should train to it, but I think we're moving away from training to this and we are gonna train um, to the other approaches. The one other thing that we did with the HPV was you sandwich it in other normal things. You know, Instead of saying, we've got the Tdap and the meningococcus vaccine today for your child. Oh, by the way, uh, you know, we'd like to do the HPV too. Um, some people might have some questions about that one. How do you feel about HPV? No, it's like your daughter needs the Tdap, HPV, and meningococcus, and you kind of sandwich it in the middle of a normal flow of things. It has been shown to help. I don't know that that's going to work <coughs> um, for COVID-19 vaccines. So I think, you know, not so maybe newer tools are needed for um, uh COVID. One is uh, relatable stories. <clears throat> uh, I've shared a couple of those with you. I'm going to come back to that here in one second. And my colleague's going to talk about these approaches, an acronym called EASE, and then motivational interviewing. Have any of you been trained, formally trained in motivational interviewing? You have, Terry? Uh, I was not. Um, and I, I think they're getting this now in medical school. Um, it is, uh, we tried to do this training with a group of pediatricians. This is hard to change after you've established your approach in the medical office. But if you can take even just one or two of the tools away from this, I think, and, and we train to this and that empathy, don't challenge their worldview, get them, you know, on your side about the worldview, we will make progress and getting our providers comfortable with the data. Relatable stories. Um, I told you in the Brady Monroe story, I found that with my, my lay audiences when I talk, this is the one that sort of hits them home the most or the Rob Tierstick family story. Um, I would encourage people to tell their own stories. You may have your own, maybe tell them, look at them to tell their own of what they know. This is my own. So, uh, you know, I've been asking people you know, two thirds, I mean, the data suggests that <clears throat> two thirds of Americans know someone who's been hospitalized or died from COVID. Um, asking people, do you know anyone, you know, that's been hospitalized or died from COVID? Here's who I know. Uh, my pastor, 12 years, Monsignor Jeffrey Wald, <clears throat> 57 years old. Um, as far as I knew, pretty good underlying health, a little overweight, like most priests are. Um, good or good pastors, they get everybody inviting him over to dinner. Um, he was the, he had moved to Jamestown, was the pastor there. He brought all of my kids through their sacraments. He was at our house many, many, many times. Um, and he got COVID last summer and, um, uh, ultimately succumbed to that. Dave Andall grew up on a ranch, uh, a little bit, uh, about two miles south of me, northwest of Bismarck. <clears throat> um, we knew his family very well. I was a little older. I babysat him and his younger brother and younger sister, um, he was running for the state legislature. 
56 years old, got COVID, died with the name still on the ballot um, when, he, when he was running there. Um, they didn't have time to get his name off the ballot. ballot. Um, so, you know, maybe encouraging people to ask about those stories um, and telling their own. 